would just do a free-for-all Q&A while we wait for 9.15 to get here as a benefit for those of you who turned up at the stated time. Are there any questions about our procedure? <laughs> <laughs> then let's proceed. Now listen, your question cannot be idiosyncratic or to embarrass anyone. It needs to be generally edifying. So you, you ask a question because you think it's going to edify the churches represented in the room. All right? So sincere question that you think would be helpful for us to think about together, and Russ and I will both try to give it our best. Or we can just talk to each other till 9.15. <laughs> you got to say your name, your church, and where you're from. Hey, my name is uh, Ronnie Kurtz. I'm with Emmaus Church in Kansas City. I asked this question. Kansas or Missouri? Missouri. Right. The good side. Um, you, brother, you didn't need to do that. <laughs> You're right. I'm You're so sorry. You're a pastor. <laughs> That's right. Move on. Um, my, my question is this. I asked it this morning in the CBMW Council as well. Um, I just kind of want to hear what you guys think about it. In terms of complementarianism and, and where we draw the lines of women teaching and having authority, uh, my question goes like this Where do we draw those lines in places that aren't the church? So should I as a man feel conviction about? Reading a book from a woman or a devotional or listening to an academic lecture from a woman And, and things like that does that that question make sense makes perfect sense I understand it and, and Russ has a wonderful answer for <laughs> Actually, I think John Piper has a wonderful answer to that one, and he, he wrote an article several years ago, um, I, and I don't remember exactly where it was, where he's, he's talking about degrees of authority uh, in, in, terms of, um, in terms of teaching. I think it's, ex it's exactly right on, where you don't, you don't necessarily have easy rules for those sorts of things, but there is a distinction between the teaching authority that goes on in the church and what happens uh, outside of the church. There's a... Um, a, a less direct sort of uh, instruction and pastoring of someone in that sense. And so I don't think there's, there's anything in violation of 1 Timothy 2 in being edified by a woman who is uh, teaching you in multiple ways uh, that doesn't involve the sort of teaching authority that happens within the discipleship of the church. Sometimes, just because of the nature of ministry the way it is now, there's going to take some judgment and discernment as to the gray area is there. But in the instances that you mentioned, no, I don't think there's anything biblically wrong with that. Yeah, I think of uh, Elizabeth Elliot, whom the Lord promoted to glory mm -hmm. today, I guess. Uh, she went home to be with the Lord. Uh, I think many of us have been blessed by her books. Uh, I think she certainly understood herself to be acting under authority. Uh, she was herself about as strong a complementarian as you can make. Yeah. And, uh, and I don't think there's anything inconsistent about me reading either her her advice to particularly young people or her accounting of God's grace in her own life, both of which she wrote on very powerfully. Um, I don't think that would violate First Timothy 2. I don't think I shouldn't have a conversation with a woman and learn from that. Uh, I think what I'm what I, not to do from First Timothy 2, if I understand what Paul is saying there to Timothy, is I'm not to encourage a woman in my church to stand and teach God's word uh, to men. Because there is a role of leadership that is inherent in teaching uh, that she is then taking. Now I stated that broadly and vaguely, and I would allow, I would encourage a lot of charity between congregations if they draw the lines in slightly different right. places. I think yeah. it'd be very easy to start fresh wars and mm -hmm. murder each other over this in a way that would not be helpful. Mm -hmm. right. But specifics would be left to the each church. And I would also recommend Jonathan Lehman's article just a couple of weeks ago, yeah, I think, uh, on this issue about congregational authority as it relates to teaching, because I think it's really good in clearing up a lot of confusion about that in a congregational setting. Yeah. Other questions you think would be helpful, useful for us to quickly tackle before we get to the official conversation this evening? I have a question. Got to stand up. Oh, you are? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> It's not that you're short. It's just you're way far back there. I'm not that short. No. Jonathan Woodyard, Bethlehem Baptist Church, Minneapolis, Minnesota. My question, I see you two sitting up there. Love both of you. And Dr. Moore, uh, you're involved in the political arena. Uh, big time pastor Mark is 
a faithful expositor. I'm just wondering in terms of politics in the pulpit and how you balance it out, what you address in a local church setting, and how both of you would answer that question. Uh, I'll go first on that one since I'm pastoring a local church. I think the principles that politics inevitably ends up resting on and advocating, you have to address. You address it every week in your teaching. I think the fact that there are different ways that you can get there by policies, specific policies, you have to be very careful about treading in there. And I do think there are sometimes conservative evangelicals have made a hash of things by not understanding that. I remember one situation in our church a few years ago where uh, a certain member of our church who was a member of a legislative body had voted for a particular thing that on the face of it was egregious. And as elders, we were talking about it. And thankfully, God has given us Andy Johnson, one of our pastors, who worked for 10 years for the Democrats in the House and two years for Republicans in the Senate. And he was able to inform us in the legislative process of why it could have been quite advantageous for that man to have voted as he did at that moment in order for him to give, have a voice in revising the bill and some really helpful, just very complicated things that's never going to make it on cable news, uh, but which are legitimately things that we got to take into account uh, as, uh, as pastors of local churches. Rush, you want to shed some well, I think, clarity? Uh, I think that uh, Carl Henry had a, a really good way of, of laying this out. There are some issues that are uh, revealed truths in Scripture that they uh, deal with social or political issues, as we would call them, and those we speak to directly with directness, thus saith the Lord. There are other issues that there are principles uh, that are found in Scripture that we teach and preach that may express themselves in different ways. So we care for the poor. Uh, now, you may have two members of your church, one that's advocating for a higher minimum wage because he wants to, uh, he says, we have single moms in our communities. They can't take care of their families. We need a higher minimum wage. Another person in your congregation that says, I don't want to raise the minimum wage because I think that's going to cause employers to start laying off the single moms who are in our church, and we think it'll have a bad effect. These are two people who are both being informed by biblical principles who are arguing about the prudence of, of how to, to carry that out. Uh, that, that's, that's something that I think is certainly appropriate within, within the body of Christ, and we can uh, agree to disagree on those policy implications. I would have a different understanding if I had someone who's a member of my church that said the poor are losers and they're takers and they're parasites on society. We, should, uh, we shouldn't worry about them at all. That's a disciplinable heart problem that's taking place. And then there are issues that we don't, uh, we, don't uh, we simply leave to the conscience uh, of the individual. So there, there, there's absolutely no reason for a church to have a position on a balanced budget amendment or a line item veto or, or uh, those sorts of things. And I certainly don't think that endorsing candidates uh, from, uh, from, from the position of the church is, uh, is a good use of the church's authority. You don't have the prophetic authority to decide who God has, uh, who God has anointed to be uh, in, in a particular position. And when you do that, what you're, what you're doing is actually compromising the authority of the church because you breed cynicism among people who say, well, this is just someone who sort of is using religion in order to get to these other goals. So why, what's the hidden agenda behind the other things uh, that he's preaching and teaching? So I would certainly uh, avoid that and keep a prophetic distance uh, when it comes to candidates. And that, the same thing would apply with the sort of wink, wink, nod, nod stuff uh, that some congregations do around election time. Oh, we're going to have Brother Smith come and give his testimony this morning uh, as though we just have no idea that he's running for governor and uh, he just happens to be coming into town. Uh, that, that's an improper use of the authority of the church, I think. Jonathan, did we get your question? Okay. Yep. Did I only plant two questions? I guess so, yeah. <laughs> Up here, Charles. Okay. Somebody else want to get one ready over here, like with the second microphone? So we'll have somebody ready. Hey there. My name is Aaron Wine, Lakeview Baptist Church in Auburn, Alabama. Or Eagle. Uh, so potentially, Lord willing, as a, as a future church planter, um, going into a community sharing the gospel, making disciples, leading them to come together. Culturally, when we, I guess, distinct ourselves as a church, um, when
when does that happen in the life of a Bible study so that me as a potential pastor could start implementing things like formal church discipline, membership, covenant, that sort of thing? When does a Bible study, in your perspective and your understanding of the scriptures, when, when do you become a local church? Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Uh, when you're not just about undergraduates at Auburn, you know, when you're, when you're for anybody, so you're not just about professors at the school or people who do this one sport, or when you're for anybody, any sinner wants to repent, that, that's who you're for. And when you say, I'm going to regularly here on the Lord's Day have the preaching of God's Word, we will baptize and we will give the Lord's Supper and we will practice membership and discipline implicit in giving the Lord's Supper. That would be my short answer. Mm, I agree with that. You're, you're covenanting together to be uh, a church and to seek the Lord's presence among you at that point. Yeah. Aaron, is that helpful? I guess like Here we go. Yeah. Often I find when we answer the first question, we then get the real question. I guess like what, what specific practice when you begin in your mind of an, if your understanding of ecclesiology is it when you begin to practice the ordinances is it when you covenant together does that make sense when I is think that covenant threshold? together is, is a good way to summarize it okay yeah yeah I and mean, think think of it uh an analogy would be a wedding uh you're you're, you're making vows uh to one another you're making a commitment to one another yeah. uh, same thing is happening as a church where you as a body are agreeing we are going to covenant with one another hold one another accountable be under the lordship of christ together as a body guys at the back there are probably going to be a lot of people coming in in the next few minutes. As that happens, you might want to just tell them there are lots of seats up front, or else they'll think it's full. So just as they come in, just tell them there are lots of seats up front. Somebody over here had a question. So anybody? Going once. Going twice. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I got in a little late. So my name's Adam. I'm from uh, central Mississippi. All um, right. And uh, God's country. I know. Yeah. Thanks. Um uh, the issue I, I would have is just with church discipline. How do we address transgender issues and same-sex attraction? I mean, even in Mississippi, you know, it's starting to you know creep up a little bit. I teach in a local high school, freshman, and you know, those are things that you know, even as a teacher and a coach, I kind of have to deal with a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you deal with uh, just the reorientation, if you want to, for a lack of a better term, you know, with identification? How do we walk that? through in the local church context. Name again? Uh, Adam. And Adam, do you teach at a public high school? I do. Wow. Now, I'm and not talking about church discipline there, obviously, but right. um, but, but I have connections with, with the school now in, in the church setting, which is one reason I teach and coach too. So. Mm -hmm. And your bathrooms are still gender specific? Yes, yes. Thank is you. Is there a move in Mississippi to end that? I wouldn't think so. Mississippi would be the last place. Where yes. That <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think this is a perfect example of the kind of issue that we pay Russ the big bucks. <laughs> Russ Moore. Well, I would say I would say that you gave two dip, two different scenarios there with the transgender question and same sex attraction issue. I think the the main thing though is having an understanding of what temptation is and what what vulnerability to temptation is in such a way that what you're communicating to people is not that coming to Christ means an absence of temptation. Coming to Christ means declaring war on whatever those sets of temptations are. And that we have uh, Galatians 6, we're bearing each other's burdens uh, within, within the congregation. Also to recognize that repentance is necessary in order to follow Christ. So if someone comes to me and says, I'm, I'm transgender, I don't identify with who I am biologically, uh, who God created me to be. I'm going to be in revolt against that, and I'm not willing for that to be interrogated by God. That's not a repentant spirit. In the same way that someone who comes to you and says, I want to follow Jesus, but I'm not going to give up fornication, or I'm not going to give up whatever the, the issue is, that's not a repentant heart. I want to see repentance. But I also know that after that, sanctification for all of us is a long process. And so you can't expect that this person who is uh, transgender, who has probably been through a very long and difficult situation, is going to suddenly receive Christ, be baptized, and then just just be be completely uh, free of all of that. You need the rest of the body of Christ to say, how do we help to cultivate in this man what it means to be a man, or in this woman what it means to be a woman, people who may be deeply alienated from that and have been for years, it takes the word takes the rest of the body, takes patient endurance in, in moving that person along. Several years ago, um, in my Christian ethics class, I taught at 
Southern, the final exam, was, was a similar question. I said, you know, you're at the end of a, a service and a woman named Joan comes to see you and she says, I want to follow Christ. I'll do whatever it takes to follow Christ. I'm 50 years old, she says, but that she had gender reassignment surgery when she was 20, has lived as a woman ever since, doesn't know anything else uh, except to live as a woman. All her coworkers know her as a woman. Her, her daughter that she adopted 10 years ago knows nothing about this background. And the question that they had for the final exam is, what do you say to her or to him, and how do you work this person through that, through that process? And what, what I noticed was this was maybe uh, 2008, 2009. Most of the students in the room kind of laughed and thought I was throwing a curveball trying to trick them. Every congregation is having to answer that question right now or else they have an entire segment of their mission field that they're not addressing with the gospel. And so uh, I would want to see repentance, and then I would want to recognize and lead my church to know we're all sinners, none of us are freaks, there's no one who is too far gone for the grace of the, of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit, and then work the congregation through that together. What about the pastoral care aspect of that? Uh, pastorally, I think having that understanding at the beginning is going to be the basis of any good pastoral care. I think you have to understand that the church is only for sinners. Mm -hmm. So there's just no space for non-sinners in the church. Mm -hmm. It is only for sinners. And inside that, it is only for a certain kind of sinners. It is only for repenting sinners. That's the only thing where we have any grace of God in. And if we know that, and we don't assign a special you know, area of disapproval to this area of struggle or temptation or sin, then I think we're in the position where we do that. But there's, there's no doubt that you're going to have to face difficult questions both with your elders or the leadership of your church and, and getting the same mind, not even on what's necessarily right and wrong, but on the, what do you do practically with that. And then in the, in the fact that inside your local church and the congregation beyond the leadership, there'll be strong divisions of ideas sometimes about what to do. Mm -hmm. So I think a whole separate front of temptation that Satan has for us is not only to default on difficult countercultural truths, but I think that's a significant temptation to churches right now and will only get worse. But a whole second front is to divide local churches mm -hmm. that all agree X is wrong, but disagree in the specifics of how the church should teach on slash enforce responding to specific situations. Can the baker bake the cake? You know, and I think mm -hmm. that's where we have to be extremely wise. And maybe we can talk about that more mm -hmm. in the session that we're about to have right now that Philip is about to introduce for us. We want to welcome you officially to the start of this conversation tonight. It's a joy to partner with our friends at Nine Marks to have this discussion on connecting church and culture. For those of you who haven't met, my name is Philip Bethencourt. I serve as the Executive Vice President. I'm going to be moderating the discussion tonight with Jonathan Lehman from Nine Marks. He's the editorial director there. And our goal is really simple. We want to help you think through how the gospel applies to the culture and applies to the church so that you can model your ministry in the church and in the culture in a way that honors Jesus. And what we're going to do tonight is have a conversation. Jonathan and I are going to lead the discussion and ask some questions at the start of things. And then we're going to open it up to questions that come from you. And the way that you're going to submit your questions throughout the night that you want to be asked later on is through our hashtag on Twitter. So if you're on Twitter, tweet your question to us uh, using the hashtag ERLC9Marks. So if something comes to mind as we're discussing it, use that hashtag ERLC9Marks to frame your question and that will be the way that we get to some of those issues as the conversation goes along. Now, we expect an influx of people to come in whenever David Platt's done preaching. And so I, I noticed some of you are setting up like this is a Southwest Airlines flight. And so you're kind of putting stuff next to you and you're acting big, thinking maybe you can stretch out or take up a bunch of space. You're probably going to need to move to the middle, move towards the front whenever that comes along. And so I just want you to be prepared for that when that comes. Now, we've got some special things for you in your seats. You'll notice in those bags a number of resources. One this of the ones... feeling kind of Oprah-like to me, Philip. Yeah. Look <laughs> in your right. chair. <laughs> and we've got cars for everybody! <laughs> yeah, there's no cars tonight, but there are some good things. So Nine Marks, as you know, does a great resource every two months, the Nine Marks e-journal. And one of the recent ones was on the Vanishing Church, and they have printed that out so you can have a hard copy of that and enjoy that as a resource. We've got some great uh, ERLC resources, inc including our Protecting Your Ministry booklet, so that when you have questions about how do you protect your church from sexual orientation and gender, gender identity lawsuits, you can find 
language for bylaws, constitution, facilities use policies, etc. But one thing I want to draw your attention to in particular is you'll notice a chapter sampler from Dr. Moore's upcoming book, Onward, in that. And you, you need to pull that out and have a look at it because on the cover of some of those booklets, there's going to be a sticker on there that's telling you that you win a full pre-pub copy of that tonight. And the way that you're going to get that is when you leave tonight and head out the check-in table that you went to, they'll have copies of that at the back and you can help yourself. For those of you that don't get a copy tonight, it drops August 1 and we encourage you to check that out. So as we talk tonight, I want you to encourage you to submit those questions with the hashtag ERLC9Marks. And let's just go ahead and get started, Dr. Moore. So I just mentioned the book. Uh, in this book, what you're trying to do is to talk about the way that the Bible Belt in America is collapsing and how that reshapes the way that we do cultural engagement. And one of the provocative things that you say in there that I'd love for you to talk more about with the group is you say that the collapse of the Bible Belt is bad for America, but it's good for the church. What do you have in mind with that? Well, I mean, I think there are all sorts of things that didn't happen in certain parts of the country because of the social pressure of the Bible Belt. So think about, for instance, um, uh, for a long time in the South and in parts of the Midwest, there were people who didn't divorce uh, because they knew if they divorced, they were going to become social pariahs uh, in their community. They would be uh, out of, of step with their local churches, which meant they wouldn't be able to get the sort of jobs they needed. They wouldn't be able to be seen as good people and as good citizens. So they stayed together. Uh, and uh, that was good for kids. That was good for uh, a lot of uh, families. It, it kept a divorce culture from ravaging uh, certain places. But when you have the sort of Christianity where in order to be part of the community, you have to be baptized into the church and at least, uh, at least have this nominal affiliation with the church, you wind up with a collapsing in of the distinction between the church and the world, which becomes the very thing that as Baptists, uh, we were dissenting against established churches. They said in order to be a part of England and to be a good uh, Englishman or, or, or a citizen of the, uh, of the kingdom, you have to be baptized in as a baby into the Anglican church. Well, uh, we created something similar to that in many parts of the, of the country where you weren't an infant, but you needed to buy by 12 years old uh, or, or 14 years old. If you weren't baptized, it's, it's because you were making a conscious decision to be a rebel against not just Jesus, but the, your family, the social order, and everything else. That led to some really bad consequences for the church in terms of the church's witness, which the New Testament says comes with its distinctiveness. Uh, that's why Peter talks about being strangers, being exiles, being a, a holy people who are proclaiming to the outside world in terms of, of the light that has been given, of people who've come out of darkness. So what we have now, instead of wringing our hands and, and being in this sort of uh, panic mode that a lot of people get in, um, we're, we're heading into this time of cultural decline, everything's falling apart, uh, that, that, that is such an unfaithful response uh, to what's happening in culture, as though somehow cultural forces are able to dethrone Jesus um, as the sovereign ruler of the universe. Response ought to be to say instead, how does the church become the church in a culture like this? And I think God is giving us an opportunity to reclaim our distinctiveness and to reclaim our strangeness so that some of the people who previously would have affiliated with the church in order to be good Americans, uh, increasingly it's going to be difficult to be a good American and a Christian at the same time. I think that can be very good for the witness of the church. Yeah, I, th I think also that it, when we say that, we're very much locating ourselves more specifically than the local church should be. So what I mean by that is we're very much saying, uh, I'm not a Latino when I'm saying that, because the percentage of Latino evangelicals is much higher now than it was 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. We're also saying, I'm certainly not an African American, because 1940s were no glory days for our right. African American brothers and sisters, exactly. so I must be a white evangelical who's from America who's saying this. Mm -hmm. So when we do those decrying things, it's just a little subtle way to communicate. By the way, if you're not a white American, our church isn't really for you. This is a bunch of people that it's our problems and that's what we're talking about from our perspective. And I don't think we mean to do that as gospel people. I think we want to think more broadly and widely than that. We want to think for the, the whole church of Jesus Christ in the area where we are. And, and we, also what it tends to do 
is it tends to put the center of your focus somewhere in the past. Mm -hmm. So what, what we're, we're wanting to re reclaim America for Christ. Um, as though we had America and we've lost America. So you hear people, America's now post-Christian. America is at best pre-Christian uh, right now. And so we're not looking backward and saying we need to get back to the 1980s or the 1950s or the uh, 1770s. We're saying we're moving to the future toward God joining heaven and earth in Revelation 21 and 22. That's where we're marching forward. And so we have that. I mean, think about the sort of language the Apostle Paul uses to Timothy. People love to, to quote from 2 Timothy 3, where he's talking about the false teachers and things going from bad to worse. And yeah, look around, everything's just falling apart, it's all going to hell. Paul doesn't have that attitude. He says the false teachers, they're like Janus and Jambres, they did not get very far because their folly becomes evident to all. You preach the word. And I think that's the message that we need to have instead of panic. Raise your hand if you did not hear Russ's message last night. If you did not hear it, raise your hand. Okay, Russ, I want you to just to reprise one little bit that's right on this topic. Oh, yeah. um, I loved it when you were talking about the way we need to prepare ourselves to receive the refugees from mm -hmm. the sexual revolution. That's my experience already in our church in Washington. It's going to be that way more and more. That's the kind of confident, positive, merciful attitude we need. Half the people in this room didn't hear you say it. You say it better than anybody I've heard say it. Say it again, Sam. Okay. <laughs> well, think about, uh, think about uh, some forms of revivalism uh, that happened in this country that came in and gave this message. If you come to Christ, you're going to be happy. Your problems are going to be gone. Your marriage is going to be good. What does that tend to leave people with? It, it's a burned over sense of disappointment because people say this didn't keep its promises uh, to me. I think a similar thing is going on with the sexual revolution. Uh, the sexual revolution is promising people right now essentially a gospel. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's good news that is coming. Sometimes the sort of language that I hear, it almost sounds like a kind of Luke 4. The spirit of something is upon me because I've been anointed to preach good news to those who are trodden down. I think there are going to be many, many people in our culture who are going to be disappointed because the sexual revolution cannot keep its promises. Mm. And so we need to be ready for a refugee crisis of people who are going to be saying, where can I go when this doesn't work anymore? So think of the woman at the well uh, with Jesus. I mean, John 4, 16 is striking. Jesus is not shocked by her. Jesus is not disgusted by her. And Jesus says to her in John 4, 16, go get your husband and come here. Both parts of that sentence are going to be essential for us in the generation to come. Mm -hmm. There are some people who would tell us, don't talk about your husband. Don't, don't deal with the issue of the fact that she's had five husbands and the man she's living with right now is not her husband because that's offensive. We need to instead get her into the gospel and then later deal with those issues. Jesus gets right at that question in order to call her to repentance. And then he says, on the other hand, and come here. He knows all about her and he's giving her an offer of, uh, of, of rest, an offer of, of cleansing through the gospel. We're going to have all these refugees from the sexual revolution, and there are two kinds of people who are not going to be able to reach those refugees. Uh, the people who have given up the gospel, including the call to repentance, they're not going to respect you. People know how to read texts. They know how to read text. They know what Romans says. They know what 1 Corinthians says. And if you come in and say, you know what? After 2,000 years of interpretation, we've just decided that the Bible is actually fine with homosexuality or with whatever the issue is. People are going to know you're afraid of them and you are tailoring your gospel in order not to address something that is unfashionable right now at this moment. So how can you take me to eternal life if you're too afraid to speak to me right now about what you think will offend me? You can't do it with them. But the other group that won't be able to reach them are the people who have been screaming at them, demonizing them, raising money off of them, and a thousand other things. So if we're the people who speak with both truth and with grace, what you're going to find is not that you're going to become less controversial, 
it means that you're going to become more controversial because if you speak both of a call to repentance and an offer of mercy, you're going to have some people offended that you're calling to repentance. And you have other people offended that by your offer of mercy, you're going soft. You eat with tax collectors and sinners. Mm-hmm. Ah, that's what it means to follow Jesus. We need to just do it and go forward. Mm-hmm. Before two, Jonathan wait, two quick comments. Next, yeah, two oh, quick comments. One, Caleb Colton back has a good book on this coming out called Messy Grace. Mm-hmm. He was in the New York Times article this last week with Matthew Vines. They did a long article showing how evangelical Christians are going both ways. I don't know that Matthew Vines would qualify as an evangelical Christian, right. but Caleb certainly does. His book Messy Grace is about him growing up with a lesbian mom married to a woman back before it was legal and a gay dad divorced and him coming out as an evangelical as a teenager. Mm. Uh, when he comes to Christ. And Caleb does it. He gets the balance just right, like Rosaria Butterfield does mm-hmm. in her memoir. Mm-hmm. So this is Messy Grace coming out very soon by Caleb Kaltenbach, a pastor out in L.A. Uh, second thing, uh, the way I as a pastor use the Southern Baptist Convention for my staff, it's our kind of staff retreat, and we try to do things together. We get here on Saturday. Sunday, we always go to a local church. Sunday, we decided to go to a mainline Protestant church here in Columbus. I won't name the church, but we went to this particular church, some of the guys on my staff had never been to a mainline Protestant church. Uh, it was fascinating. It was deeply sad. Uh, one of the things they were doing was taking up their offering to give to a LGBT group to advocate for uh, that being seen as good, normal, biblical. They were just assuming that. That's what the offering we sang the doxology after it as it went forward. Mm. Uh, that's, it, w- it was the kind of anti-SBC in a lot of ways. Mm. But one of the most amazing parts of it was they kept referring, they kept using this phrase, we are celebrating pride this week. And all, all the staff commented over lunch, like, you know, pride didn't work in the Garden of Eden. Pride didn't work at the Tower of Babel. Pride's not going to work in Columbus, Ohio. It's just, it's just not going to ultimately work. And the irony, the spiritual irony, that they would have hit upon that word, mm. it speaks more than they mean it to speak, mm. I fear. Are those the banners around town? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. As well? yeah. Before we it's jump not into our next question, I know, a lot of you, I know a lot of you have come in uh, since we started. We're going to be taking your questions at the second half of this conversation, and the way you submit those is by Twitter using the, the hashtag ERLC9Marks, and we got dozens of people standing in the back. So Lots if there, if there are any chairs, chairs that are on the inside of you, can you just slide over to open up the outside aisles? That would be a big help to freeing up some of those. And, uh, and we'll keep uh, pushing along, Jonathan, whenever you want to take us next. Yeah, sure. Well, just before we, we uh, wow. give him a second. Uh, yeah. Kevin, that's my bag, by the way. Thanks, man. <laughs> uh, guys, before we leave this matter of cultural declension that you, you brought up, Philip, uh, what I appreciate about both of you is that you do a great job of sounding the optimistic Jesus wins note in, in, in your speaking. Mark, you're always talking about the church wins, and, and you have that phrase, Russ, what is it? we're not slouching towards Gomorrah, but marching to Zion, is mm-hmm. that? Mm-hmm. And both of you do a great job at that. At the same time, uh, we are in an era where there is increased opposition, whether you're black or white, for being a Christian. So the brother in our church who had a copy of What is the Gospel and Who is Jesus on his desk and his, his employer said to him, hey, those could be construed as coercive. You need to take those off the desk. This is a government employee. That's right. Your tax dollars pay for that supervisor to do his job who told our elder that at his work. So for the typical pastor in here getting into the pulpit on Sunday morning, uh, we trust that his job in some ways is the same preach the word in season out of season no matter where we are what we're doing that's his job but what are some uh, unique things to this time and place this moment that you would encourage the the pastor of churches in in these conditions to be thinking about and and, and peppering his his church uh, in in preparation for this kind of environment Mark start with you yeah uh, be informed uh, read editorials, uh, particularly uh, of the things that your people may be reading. Read them with critical thoughts in mind. Read Christians who will inform you. Read Russ's stuff. Read Al Mohler. Listen to Al's briefing. Uh, 
try to think critically about the issues that you're you're hearing about because the, the mainline media are not they don't have an interest in presenting things in the way that you're going to think about it so I, I was looking at a tweet yesterday from religion news service and they said michigan law lets uh religiously minded exceptions uh remain uh to to a particular law even the way that's presented is 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 changing the argument it's putting you on the defensive so you might want some help in doing that one very simple thing i would encourage you to do is in your morning service allow time for now be careful this might surprise you for prayer I mean, seriously, during that 45 minutes of your morning service, or however long you give the Lord each week, you know, allow there to be a time for prayer where you, as the local church pastor, actually lead the congregation in intercession and pray about all kinds of matters. One of the main sources I have for my pastoral prayers every single Sunday is the Washington Post. Uh, I use it. I use the front page. I use the local section. I want to pray about the schools in the district. I want to probably pray about the police force. I want to pray about problems that are going on in it. So I may not make any political comments in my sermons. My prayers, on the other hand, I've prayed for governments to change. You know, I, I've prayed for, uh, that's why I pray for the persecuted church. Uh, brother pastors, particularly speaking to you, I think you can be catechizing your congregation in how to pray about some of these issues uh, in your own pastoral prayers on Sunday morning. Now, to do that, you need to allow some substantial time for them. You need to stop these three-minute prayers while the you know, ensemble musically is changing behind you. And, and you need to pray for five or ten minutes. I mean, give some thought to your prayer. At the Westminster Assembly in the 1640s, uh, they would have a day of prayer where they would move over from the abbey. If you've ever been to London, Westminster Abbey, right next to it was another church, St. Margaret's Church. They would move over there for the day of prayer where they would have an hour-long sermon. Then they'd have an hour-long prayer. Then they'd have maybe a two-hour-long sermon. There may be two hour long prayer. And the pastors would prepare their prayers every bit as much as they would work on preparing their sermons. Anyway, Russ? I would also say teach your people how to distinguish between persecution and insult. Uh, there, is, uh, there is no promise in following Christ that we would be free from insult. And so there is a, a kind of mentality that, that assumes that everyone should think well of us, and so anyone who says something negative about Jesus or Christianity or the church is thereby, uh, is thereby persecuting us in some way. And, and so teach your people how to bear insult well, Sermon on the Mount uh, sort of language, at the same time that you're not teaching people to be passive uh, in the place of uh, institutional erosion of, uh, of religious uh, freedom for, for everybody. Teach them the difference between those, those two things and make sure that when you are referring to situations that you know what you're talking about because there's an entire industry out there that um, and what the world loves to do in any forum is to find victims and to hype uh, the situation of the victims because the way that you really build an audience is to say, we're good, they're bad, they're evil, look what they're doing to us, stop them now. And so you can find these sorts of things that will do that for Christians and you can come up and talk about particular horrible situations that actually, when you get in them and you find out what's going on, it's not true or it's not exactly true that way. And if you rely on that sort of thing, then you're going, to, you're going to breed a kind of cynicism in your people who are going to say, yeah, this is the same thing that, we, that, we've, always, that we've always heard. You have, you have a lot more credibility when you investigate what's happening and you speak truthfully, not to mention the sort of moral authority. I mean, the, the Scripture commands us not to bear false witness, including against our opponents or our enemies. So make sure you do your homework, and if you're not sure, don't talk about it till you are sure. So in my five or ten minute pastoral prayer, I'll spend 30 minutes to an hour preparing that, uh, just to make sure, in particular on any sort of convoluted phrases or, or difficult situations. Yeah. You also talk about a lot about tarring the ark. What yeah, does that mean? I, I, yeah, I, I feel with nine marks for 20 years, what I've been trying to do is to tell churches, a flood is coming, we need to tar the ark. You know, before, it seems like 20 years ago, almost nobody was talking about church discipline, not in our circles. Mm -hmm. And, and the, impenetra or the penetrability, rather, the, the, the lack of distinction between the church and the world was just painful. Mm -hmm. I would say now it's marginally better. And it's probably much more so because of the secularizing of the culture than, than any work of nine marks. 
you know, it's the, the churches are getting a little bit more distinct from the world, and I think we're just going to have to be. Mm -hmm. I think part of what we have to do is recover that distinction between the church and the world. Mm -hmm. well, one of the places we're going to see that distinction between the church and the world start to continue to crystallize even further is on the issue of marriage. And so we all know that here in the next couple of weeks that the Supreme Court's going to make a ruling on marriage. And Dr. Moore, I want to start with you. How can our churches right now be preparing to minister? Let's say we, we have a ruling that nationalizes same-sex marriage and it finds a constitutional right to that. What are, what are some of the pieces of counsel that you would give to the people here in terms of how they can be thinking about equipping their churches right now? Well, I mean, the first thing you have to do is to prepare to articulate what you mean in preaching and teaching when you're talking about marriage and sexuality. I mean, there, there's a, a certain kind of evangelical culture that we've had um, for maybe a hundred years uh, in this country, or at least in parts of this country, where marriage and family was sort of the bridge to get people to Jesus. So you could come in and talk about, you know, everybody aspires to a good marriage, everybody aspires to a good family, and Jesus is the way uh, to get you to that sort of relationship. Well, now... Uh, the, the culture no longer aspires to the same vision of marriage uh, that, that we do and often don't even understand uh, the concepts. I mean, why would you, why would you have this, this definition of, of marriage? It must be because you have hostility toward people or hatred toward people. So what you have to do is to get up and say, here's what we believe about marriage. We don't believe that marriage is just a social issue or a political issue. We believe that marriage, God put marriage, embedded it in the creation, to point to the union of Christ and his church. It's a mystery that God is revealing, Ephesians chapter 5. That's why we think you can't tamper with it and, and, and make it interchangeable in all of these uh, various ways. So you're teaching what that is. That's not unusual. That's the exact thing the apostles had to do in the first century. Because we, it's not that we have a marriage crisis right now that we've never seen before. The Apostle Paul is having to distinguish Christian marriage from temple prostitution, from goddess worship in Ephesus, and from uh, a thousand other things. You have to do that and then embody that marriage culture in your local congregations. So if you're the, the, sort, of, uh, if you're the sort of church that makes no distinction in terms of who it is that you'll, you'll marry, so you, 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 don't, uh, you don't expect to hold people accountable to their vows uh, that they are making. You really cannot stand up and say, I'm trumpeting a biblical view of marriage. By that point, you're just an agent of the state carrying out what the state is doing. You're coming in and saying, what we're doing in a marriage ceremony is something that is part of the whole community's oversight in holding one another accountable. One of the most controversial things I ever do, ever, not anything that I do on TV or anything else, is when I tell a couple, you can't write your own marriage vows. That creates a lot of controversy. And the reason I do it is because there's an assumption underneath that that my marriage is my thing. It's the, it, the wedding is the celebration of Chad and Tina's love. And uh, so everybody's here to kind of see their Facebook post that's live. Uh, that's not what a wedding is. You don't, you don't necessarily even know what you are going to vow to one another uh, when you're 25 years old and you're coming together. You need the rest of the body who are coming in and preparing you to be with one another during Alzheimer's disease, through the, the death of a child, through the temptation to commit adultery, through all of these things that you can't imagine right now. So teaching your congregation along the way, this is a Christian view of marriage that is different from what the rest of the world is doing that's how you're going to build a long and sustaining marriage culture. I want to ask on this. Do you think pastors should get out of signing state contracts? They should get out of the marriage business? Not, not at this point. But, and here, here's why. Um, there, there are some people who would say, well, let's just make sure that the state doesn't have anything to do with marriage at all. And that's kind of the goal that we ought to have. Um, I don't think that is possible because the state has an interest in marriage as long as uh, as long as you don't have a state that says we don't care what happens to children, a state has a responsibility to hold people, including unbelievers, accountable to their, their marriage uh, covenants and their marriage commitments. Until we get to the point where the state is imposing upon the church um, it's the certain the marriages that the church has to perform, I don't think it's yet time to say we're not going to become involved in, in signing a marriage certificate. 
I can certainly, though, see in a Romans 14 sense how a pastor could say, my conscience doesn't allow me to sign, uh, to sign this marriage covenant, and I say we ought to be able to bear with one another and, and, uh, and, and, and let one, each one be guided by his conscience. On that. I'm going to come to this, uh, with some pastoral questions to you, but before we do that, I see about 75 people standing up in the back. So if you have any seat on your row, please move to the middle one more time so we can try to fit as many people as we can. And I'm glad you asked that question, Jonathan, about uh, getting out of the civil marriage business. One of the things that you'll find in the Light Magazine that's there in the handouts that you got today is a point and counterpoint conversation about that very question. And, and one of the things that I want you to continue to do is to submit questions via the hashtag, that ERLC9Marks hashtag, if you have questions that you want to ask. And those you that are in the back, feel free to grab a seat. Uh, but Mark, I want to ask you two pastoral questions, one related to the front door as it comes to the marriage of the church and one related to the back door. So let's imagine you have a lesbian couple that starts to visit your church. They have a nine-year-old daughter. They're unbelievers. Through the ministry of your church, uh, both of them come to repentance and faith, and they say, what does it look like for us to be uh, believers? What should we do to our relationship? Should we continue in this marriage? You know, we're married in a state that has legalized same-sex marriage. Do we need to get a divorce? How do we talk to our nine-year-old about it? What does what the front door to church membership look like for them? And then after we talk about that easy question, uh, the harder question, no, they're both complicated. The, the other question is on the back door. Let's say you had a, a, a set of members in your church who, for whatever reason, but decide... Can I not answer the first one before I don't answer the second one? Oh, sure, one? yeah, let's, yeah. Let's do the first one. Um, my serious answer to your first one is I, I, I take it to the elders. Okay. That's going to have to be a long and careful conversation. Obviously, what cannot continue is these two individuals understanding that they're married. We understand that we all understand what the state said they were and what they thought they were. So we don't need to imagine history differently. But we need to have a different understanding of marriage as part of their repentance, I think. It's such a basic part of who they are. In the same way that the, the thing Russ cited earlier from Jesus speaking to the woman at well in John 4. You know, he immediately was bringing that reality to her. The man she lived with is not her husband. So I think that that means, differently than we've had some other friends say in public conversations, he would be so slow in doing this. I think Jesus' model is a little different than that. In John 4, I think it's, it's quite quick. But the specifics of how to untangle that, that is the blessing of having elders. Let me just encourage you, if you think polity does not matter, Look around at all your Presbyterian and Episcopalian friends who've had to pay millions of dollars to get their churches out from under their bad polities. Thank God for the independence of the local church. You make a mess of it, you're just messing up your own church, not everybody else's. Part of what that means, brothers, give thanks. That's a big deal for the kingdom. That's really helpful. Part of what that means, though, is you, pastor, you need to use the resources like the ERLC, Nine Marks, people like Jonathan Russ, uh, Al Mohler, or others. You need to use these people to help educate your elders, and that means you need elders. You need not just good, faithful deacons. God bless deacons. It's a New Testament office. Another office is elders. It's always in the plural in local churches. They're people who are apt to teach the word. You want more than just you able to do that. They're gifts of Christ to his church. So take them, unwrap them, put them up there for everybody to see, and then let those brothers reason together what to do with these two now sisters in the Lord who are in a ridiculously difficult situation uh, with one of their or their daughter. And, and let those elders together lead the community in, in unpicking that mess. He's asking you the final exam question that I gave to the last group of students. Uh, yeah. So you're, you're well, I yeah. just gave you a great answer. answer. Yeah, yeah. 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 Did, 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 yeah. Did, did I gave a great grade? answer. Did you give it? A, did you grade them? Well, see, but I added that one of them was terminally ill as well. So oh, I always try to, I always try to, to mix it up a little bit. Uh, the uh, Lord is so much. Kinder. So that that was a C plus, <laughs> B minus. That was that was an A. So the, yeah, here's the back door question, and, right, and I'd love for you question. to ask that because we were we were talking about that earlier. With, if a, if a couple were to leave, well, wait, let me see, Russ. Do you want to say anything different on that front door question? No, I think that I think that's right because because uh, if you see a bright line that I don't see, man, bring no, it out. What I think what I think is is happening here is that there is not a marriage. Right. That the state does not have the authority to create a marriage. This is not a marriage. So what I would want to see it's is... We're confused by the fact that we have two different concepts using the same English word. That's exactly right. And marriage. So, yeah. And they have every right to use it any way they want. It's a made-up word, you know, marriage. Yeah. 
or than what we understand the Bible teaches about right. marriage. Right. And so I, I would want to see that they recognize that this is not a marriage. This is not going to continue in a sexual relationship, in a cohabiting relationship. There is there is a, there is effort being taken. That to there's not a repent. united family identity. That's right. That's yeah. right. And then uh, and then when it comes to the question of uh, divorce. Uh, what's happening with a divorce is a an assigning of custody, a dividing of property. Uh, it doesn't mean that what happened in the marriage is now gone. Uh, so I think that's a prudential question that I would bring to the leadership of the church and say, how do we in this situation deal with that specific yeah. question? And then, of course, the other the other area where divorce may come into it is there are going to be many situations. Think of a Rosaria Butterfield. What if she had been in some civil marriage? Yeah. Uh, she would need to be free from that right. uh, in order to, to marry uh, later on. So I think we need to keep that in mind as well. well let, let, let me come at the back door by pulling the camera back a little bit and just think about this in terms of separation generally. Uh, you may have seen the CT editorial last week in which Mark Galley came out and said, you know, CT, Christianity Today, is not going to endorse homosexuality. And then it, it was pointing to David Neff, a mm -hmm. former editor, who came out last week saying he does mm -hmm. endorse it. And what was interesting was the way the article closed. Uh, Mark Galley said that we're not going to cut ties with those who think otherwise. Mm -hmm. He didn't specify what he meant by cutting ties. Does that mean he's still going to be friends with David Neff? Does that mean he's, he's going to let David Neff write for Christianity? He, he wasn't clear. Mm -hmm. How would you guys encourage us to think about uh, separation, cutting ties, not cutting ties, with not the person who's living in homosexuality, but with the Christian mm -hmm. heterosexual mm -hmm who now says, I think this is okay. Mm -hmm. How do we think about separation, let's say in parachurch contexts? Mm -hmm. Do we have them right for Southwestern Baptist Theological Journal, TGC, ERLC? Mm -hmm. So parachurch, do we cut ties? Do we say no? Uh, how do we think about cutting ties or not cutting ties in the local church setting? So somebody's leaving your church, going to join a gay affirming church. What do you say? What do you mm -hmm. do? Well, first of all, when it comes to Christianity Today, I interpreted that in terms of personal friendships. Yeah. Uh, maybe I was misinterpreting it, but the way I interpreted it was um, that, that uh, Mark was simply saying, uh, this is somebody I respect and love. This is uh, my friend. I'm not, I'm not sending him off on an ice flow. He's still, he's still my friend, but he's wrong. That was how I interpreted it. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. So, uh, but when it comes to the issue of those who are uh, professing Christians who are seeking, seeking to teach that something that God has said is uh, sin and something that God has said those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. These people are now teaching those who practice such things will inherit the kingdom of God. I think that is definitely an issue of separating from false teaching because what's happening, I'm thinking about this the other day when I was, I was reading, um, I'm reading slowly through Galatians uh, right now and I was, I was looking at John Stott's little commentary on Galatians and he's talking about the Apostle Paul's defense of his apostleship that's happening there through Galatians 1 and 2 and he says that's always the issue is if you have, you have differing claims of apostolic authority. And that's what we have happening right now with a Matthew Vines, with a David Gushy. It's not that you just have two Christians sitting down and saying, well, we disagree about what the Bible teaches about uh, baptism or uh, the, the second coming of Christ. It's that you have cl a claim to essentially apostolic authority. If the Apostle Paul had known what we know now about sexual orientation, he would have written differently about the issue. Well, that is not just an interpretation of a moral text. That is a different understanding of the inspiration of Scripture through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's almost claiming a kind of inspiration. Well, it is because we have scientific evidence now. Yeah that gives us a different understanding that this that the apostle would have had had he had access to what we have access to now that's an issue of sufficiency of scripture it's an issue of inspiration and it is something that is saying to people you shall not surely die that is deadly deadly serious so i would take a much different tone with a sinner that i'm speaking to in terms of the gospel 
than I would with someone who is claiming the authority of the church and claiming the authority of Christ in order to say something that is contrary to the gospel. They're two very different things. I think Paul speaks differently in, in those terms. Jesus speaks differently in those terms, and so must we. And the minute that we come in and say, this is just an issue we can agree to disagree on, uh, we are, we're, we're destroying the foundations of the church, and we are sending people with, with guilty consciences uh, into a desperate situation where there is no, there is no freedom uh, for them. And so I think that's a, that's a first-order issue that we have to separate over. And so the person coming up to you saying, I'm joining this gay-affirming church, church members saying that to you, how do you respond? How do you counsel them? Um, well, I would say you, you, can't, uh, you can't join yourself as a, a Christian under the authority of Christ to a church that is teaching the opposite of what Jesus has taught in the Scriptures. So if they say, watch me and go join the local UCC church that is very clearly teaching that, what do you do? Your local church pastor? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think there are limits to what you what you can do there, other than to say to the rest of the body that they're leaving. This is someone who is uh, who is joining a fellowship that is out of step with the gospel. What would you do at Capitol Hill if that happened? We haven't had exactly that case happen, and uh, I hope we never do. Uh, if we do, if it was clear and the facts are not disputed, we would certainly, any time somebody joins us for a church that denies the gospel, uh, we would excommunicate them because we would, we would understand that they're moving to a church that is against the only hope that sinners have. Uh, so when we've had people join the Roman Catholic Church, we've excommunicated them uh, because the Roman Catholic Church is on record that they've never repented of at all in Trent for saying the very thing that we take as our only hope, they would say, is anathema. Now, by that, we don't mean to say that all Roman Catholics are lost. No, by God's grace, whatever Roman Catholic is, is trusting in Christ alone for their salvation, they'll be saved. Just like any Baptist or Methodist who is doing that will be saved. But the church that they're joining officially teaches against the gospel. And I think the way Russ has cast, cast this is exactly right. In 1 Corinthians 6, it's very clear that he says, and Paul is, is it pains to be clear, do not be deceived, he says, and he says it again. You know, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if you're going to a church that, that is teaching the opposite of that, that would be almost the definition of a false gospel. And we would not merely let them go. Now, of course, in the sense of, you know, critics online who say, oh, you're not allowing people freedom. And we're not trying to constrain them all. Of course they can leave. We're not trying to uh, physically stop them. We're not trying to slander them. We're not trying to say anything they wouldn't think is true about them. They're, we're just telling people what they're doing. But to our members, we're interpreting that as they are going to a church that teaches something against what we understand is the only hope for salvation people have. And it, we have always and will always excommunicate such people. So you would agree with Russ that if I'm speaking pastorally... And, somebody, and when I say we there, let me just be clear. I don't mean I would, our elders would, because I don't think I have the authority to excommunicate anybody. I don't think a set of elders has the authority to excommunicate anybody, not in the New Testament. In the New Testament, in Matthew 18, only a local church can do that. Right. The congregation as a whole has to speak to that. And if you read Matthew 18, I think you'll see that in there clearly. Mm -hmm. But to clarify and summarize... Uh, you, like Russ, are going to take one tone with the person struggling with same-sex attraction or, or even the person who's living in homosexuality and, and not a member of your church and probably a severer tone, if, if I understood you correctly, a Absolutely. severer tone with the Christian heterosexual who's saying, hey, we can... We no question. This. No question. And I, actually, I would, have, I would kind of have three tiers here. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, I do not judge those who are on the outside. It's those who are on the inside that I judge, the one who bears the name of brother. I would have one tone toward the unregenerate lost person who's involved in any sort of immorality uh, that, I, that has no, I have no accountability uh, as a representative of the church over that person. We one can't tone, judge those outside. That's exactly Paul right. Paul says we can, God judges them. That's exactly right. I would have a different, uh, a different way of dealing with someone who is a member of the church, someone who is a professing believer in Christ, uh, who is involved in any sort of immorality. And then I would have a third, and this would be the severest, uh, the severest uh, tone that I would have for those who are teachers uh, in, in God's church. Let not many of you be teachers, my brothers, for you will have a stricter 
judgment, James says, who are actually leading others towards something that is, uh, is destructive no matter what it is. Uh, that would be something that, that we, we have to as a church because these are people who are dealing with people's lives and souls and consciences. And so we have to speak to that. With yeah, and there's also, just to give a little bit more nuance even to that distinction inside the church, I wouldn't want it to be a simple on-off switch they're an elder, they're not an elder. You know, I would want to say, uh, even, let's I agree with Russ entirely on what he's saying on elders, so let's say the non-elders, you have that kind of middling tone. Even there, there's going to be a big difference. Am I dealing with somebody who's from a non-evangelical background? Mm-hmm. They've been in our church for three months. I'm not sure how much they've understood. Uh, they're quite young. They're 22. Uh, I'm going to have one tone with that and another tone with somebody who's a 70-year-old, never really taught anything, not even Sunday school in our church, but they've been a member for 15 years, and now they're deciding they're going to go do this quite high-handedly. It, it's, with that mm-hmm. first one, I would have a pretty tender, I don't know if I use the word severe even, just a warning tone, mm-hmm. very serious warning tone with them. But I'd, want to be very, I'd probably have a different tone even inside Absolutely. that. I agree with that. Yeah. We're going to shift our attention to the questions coming in from you via Twitter. And so if you haven't submitted one yet, feel free to do that with the hashtag ERLC9Marks. And the first one that I want to throw out to you all comes from Javier Pena. Javier asks, how do you share the gospel with someone who is opposed to Christianity because of its teachings on things like homosexuality or transgenderism? So what we believe is controversial, how do you share somebody the gospel in that kind of situation? I, I think one of the first things you want to do is just pray that that person have a sense of their own need for a Savior. Uh, we, we tell the truth, and we have a, a remedy for a problem, and that problem people need to realize they have. And, and these issues we're talking about right now are not the only issues people need to be saved because of. Uh, again, the church is only for sinners. Uh, and that is true. There, there is no place in any Bible gospel preaching church for anybody other than a sinner. So I think you have to first just try to get rid of any self-righteousness. We're, this is not a self-salvation society. Uh, and then I, I want to pray for hunger. I'm going to share with them very clearly, you know, God, man, Christ response. Greg Gilbert's book, What is the Gospel, is great. His new one, Who's Jesus, is maybe even better. Uh, just good books to use. I'm going to be clear, but I'm going to probably spend more time where the person has questions like those things. But the fact that we call something sin, that it's not immediately obvious to them as sin, it's just a, that that's going to be a part of the basic package of understanding there's a God who's different than we are. And we don't know truth innately. We think we're the world experts on us. We're not. The Bible tells us we're not. The Bible tells us things that are true about us that even we ourselves don't think in our own fallen natures. So the fact that we have to contradict somebody is not new, and it's not over just merely these issues. And I I would want to make sure, I want to differentiate between someone who has a caricatured view uh, of a, a Christian understanding of homosexuality. There, there are people who, when I, I was at the Supreme Court the day that, that the oral arguments were taking place on the same-sex marriage case that's coming down, and I was coming with several of my staff members around the corner, and I heard someone on the bullhorn uh, screaming, and I just prayed to myself, please don't let that be one of ours. And I came around the corner, and sure enough, you had on one side uh, a, a group of people just screaming through this bullhorn, uh, you're all going to hell, and don't expect me to cry for you when you do. I mean, this is the message that's coming. There's some people who have heard that sort of thing, and they associate that with Christianity. So I think there's just this arbitrary sense where Christians just hate gay people, and they don't really have any reason to do that except that they don't know any. I want to make sure that they, they know where a Christian view of sexuality comes from, what it is that Christians believe about sin. We're not saying you have some people who are sinners out here. Romans 3, we're all sinners uh, before God. But then, uh, after that's the case, I find that what Jesus is doing whenever he is encountering people with the gospel is leaning into the controversy rather than leaning away from the controversy. So the rich young ruler, Jesus gets right into what the issue is uh, and to the point that it, it becomes frustrating to the disciples. I mean, think about John 6. You're at the seashore. People are starting to respond to what Jesus is saying. And he says to Jewish people who've been taught since they were children not to consume blood, Leviticus 17, and not to come near human corpses, unless you chew on my skin and drink my blood, you have no life in you. 
and the crowd says, this is a creepy cult, and they start uh, walking away. And even the disciples are, what are you doing? Uh, this, is, this is really hard to take. Uh, I think that's what we need to do, is to, is to lean into the strangeness with kindness and gentleness and to recognize that sometimes initial hostility to what you are saying does not mean that that person is closed to the gospel. Sometimes, I mean, think John 3, the light comes into the world. It is painful to all of us when the light shines into whatever it is that we're trying to maintain and protect. And sometimes people are going to respond in a very hostile way, no matter what it is that you're challenging, and then the word does its work. Or, as with the prodigal son, somebody encounters a crisis, and they say, where can I turn, where can I go? Uh, So don't give up on people just because they're initially hostile. The seed of the gospel can lie under the earth until we do and then spring up. Mm -hmm. You know, you may share the gospel maybe after you're gone from this world that God brings it to fruition in somebody's life. Mm -hmm. Don't give up being a faithful messenger of the gospel. If you have never preached through 1 Peter, 1 Peter hits so many of these themes that Russ and I have been talking about. Uh, Just give yourself to do an expositional series through 1 Peter sometimes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I see a couple of questions here that are interesting. Um... Do we want to stay on homosexuality or move to other things? Very nice what do you think? Moving along. Other things. If your son or daughter invited you to their same-sex wedding, would you attend? No. Somebody's asked this question. No, I don't think so. Because because of what what a wedding is, uh, a wedding is an assembly of witnesses uh, who are giving approval uh, to the union and uh, implicitly holding the couple accountable to those, to those vows. And so I wouldn't be able to do that. Would you conscience. tell a member of your church they were sinning if they did, if they decided the other thing? No, uh, I would not necessarily uh, discipline someone. Uh, I would think that person would be in error if that person came to me and asked for counsel. Uh, I would give counsel, but I would, I would not discipline someone uh, for that. Yeah, I did a breakout session at the Gospel Coalition a couple of months ago on the kind of cultural crisis that a lot of people perceive that we're in. And on this very question as an example, I said, I think we just need to give each other five or ten years of grace to figure this out. All right? We're in really new situations for us, okay? And I'm not talking about shifting your opinions on what the Bible teaches on homosexuality. I'm talking about very complicated questions like people like Russ Moore would give us finals in their ethics classes. (laughs) You know, as these things now spring to life in front of us, Mm -hmm. just give each other a little bit of time before you shoot each other. Mm -hmm. You know, just... Just, let's just wait and think carefully mm-hmm. and try to understand why Bob and Tom and Sarah and Alice all come to different positions on how they're going to respond at the reception, at the wedding. As long as they're clear on Christ, the authority of Scripture, the, the wonderful truth of gender, there's no question theologically going on. Their question is merely a pastoral one. What do they do? You need to allow a lot of grace and I think a lot of time to respond. And it's so good to have elders. Have godly mature elders who can help you think through this. Gifts of Christ to the church. The takeaway from tonight, folks, is get elders, I think, <laughs> basically. But on a related note with um, speaking to children, how many of you are parents out there in the crowd, just by show of hands? Many of you are. So, uh, you know, let's think about whether somebody's watching Sports Center on ESPN and on the ticker it's got the latest thing about. Uh, Bruce Jenner, for example, or uh, people are in their fourth grade class and their and their kids learning about various issues of immorality, and they're coming home and asking their parents, "What counsel would you give to parents who are trying to figure out what are the age appropriate ways to be able to talk to my children about things that the culture may be confronting them with?" earlier than you would prefer to have to have that conversation. How should they think about those tough, tough conversations? Well, I, I would say you need to be proactive and be, in, in most cases in our culture, earlier than you would like to be uh, in uh, addressing uh, issues because uh, you want to be that, as, as the parent, the first voice that is coming into your child's life on issues. You're not going to be able to hermetically seal your, your child off from any of these, these questions. So you want to come in with the sort of confidence that comes with people who don't have anything to fear uh, from anything that's going on out there. And you're able to talk to them and you're able to answer questions. I mean, I had my, my seven-year-old, just the, he's, he's my 
he's my lowest maintenance child. He's just he's just this really sweet natured, gentle child. And he came into me one day and he said, "How does a boy turn into a girl?" And I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "I was in the dentist office and they had the news on and they had a boy about my age who turned into a girl and I didn't think that could happen. And how do I know? Is that going to happen to me? I mean, <laughs> is, this, is this permanent?" And um, I, you know, even though I deal with these issues all the time, I was freaking out inside of my mind. Like, I don't want to have to talk to you about this right now. You're so sweet and just innocent. And, um, but if I had freaked out in front of him, I would have given him the impression there are certain things that dad's Christianity just isn't able to address. And so I had to say, well, here's the, here's the way that people think. Here's how we think as people that God has, has spoken to. And I think, I think doing that, getting ahead of what, uh, of what sorts of questions your children are going to have, having wisdom, you already have that. I mean, when we're teaching children um, about uh, human reproduction and those sorts of things, you don't, you don't traumatize children with, with everything when they're three and four years old, but you know how to, to pace that in terms of uh, age-appropriate uh, pacing. But I think that's, you, you address it, and you don't, uh, you don't uh, hide from it. No additional comments. Okay, so with that um, boy that's identifying as a girl, let's say you've got a youth pastor in your church and you've got a transgender youth that's starting to attend, you know, lost and interested in hearing the gospel. Would you counsel, so it, born a female, identifying as a male, representing uh, himself or herself as a male, how would you counsel that youth pastor on the, what pronouns to use, the way to refer to them? Should they go to the girls' Bible study or the boys' Bible study during the midweek? How do we think about some of those questions? <laughs> Russ, we're, we're just living in your world time. Okay, man. all right. Uh, I think the issue is having elders. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> well, my work is done here, friends. Good night. <laughs> here, here, here is what you want to weigh when you're dealing with that situation. You don't want to communicate not only to this person, but also to the other teenagers in that room that there are only certain sorts of sinners that Jesus came for. And you, you don't want to uh, communicate that in order for you to be ready to hear the gospel, you first have to get yourself cleaned up in order to hear it and fixed up and, and morally uh, in line in order to hear the gospel. So you, you want to weigh all of that along with the fact that you don't want to communicate something that is going to confuse this person or anyone else with an unbiblical view of gender. So I'm weighing those two things uh, at the same time when I'm talking uh, to that person. And sometimes I'm going to come down on, on, on different sides about do I temporarily call this person by a name that doesn't identify with a gender. As long as that person knows, you and I don't have the same understanding here, but I love you and I'm, I'm bearing with you right now as we're moving toward uh, sharing the gospel with you. In the same way, I mean, I have, um, I have uh, known of people who have uh, become involved in uh, non-Christian cults and have taken on names that are associated with the gods of those cults or something along those lines and have referred to people by those names. Now, I would expect uh, that in most cases, if those people came to Christ, they're going to abandon that. But you're weighing those two those two things as you're as you're doing it. I think. Uh, Jonathan E. Bennett wants to know, how would you counsel change of direction here? How would you counsel a wife who wants to be faithful to Christ, but is in an abusive situation with her husband? Why do you say but? Oh, that wasn't well, your question. No. Presumably because there's things impelling her towards separation. Okay. Yet at the same time, she wants to be submissive and honor her husband. And she's feeling that, I'm guessing, she's feeling that tension. Yeah, if, she, if she's in physical danger, I'm going to tell her to get out. Uh, if she's in great fear, I'm probably going to tell her to get out. Even if it's just temporary. Uh, we're going to take it to the elders. Uh, <laughs> seriously. The elders are going to pray. They're going to talk with her. They're going to talk with him if he's willing. Um, yeah. But one of the things that we want to be careful, sometimes conservative evangelicals, because we don't believe in divorce, or at least we believe in divorce in only very specific circumstances, 
uh, get the uh, get the reputation that we don't care about spousal abuse, and that's not true at all. Uh, and if if there's a pastor's ever given you that that uh, intimation or suggestion, uh, please forgive us for that. We don't mean to communicate that at all. Uh, we're trying to be faithful to what marriage is and the commitment, the serious commitment that marriage is, the wonderful unity God makes. And at the same time, we see the very real separation that our sins can make, the sins of adultery and of abuse. So I know in our church, we as elders will take that very seriously. We'll act very quickly on that in order to, to secure kind of physical safety. And then we'll just kind of pick up the pieces and see where things are. And I, I would also make sure that she knows that submission in Scripture, except to God, is always limited and bounded. Uh, we have submission, Romans 13, 1 Peter 2, to the state, to the governing authorities, but that's not unlimited submission. Uh, so Revelation 13, we refuse to submit to a state that demands uh, worship. And a submission of a wife to her husband is not a submission to uh, this sort of uh, cruelty to her. That's the first step. Um, the second thing, I, we have different convictions about divorce and remarriage. I think there are exception uh, clauses in Scripture that allow for divorce and remarriage. That would be sexual immorality and 1 Corinthians 7, the abandonment by an unbelieving spouse. I think that an unrepentant abuse uh, of a woman constitutes, in my opinion, abandonment by an unbelieving spouse. It is physically unsafe for her to be in her own home. Forced abandonment. Yes, it would. Yes, indeed. And that's so, what our elder. That's how our elders take it at yeah. CHBC. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So here's here's another question. This one comes from Spencer Plumley, and we just got time for one or two more questions. So if you want to sneak one in on the hashtag ERLC Nine Marks, and Spencer asks this. How should a pastor speak about the dangers of sexual sin publicly while still creating a refuge for broken people? I want to ask this in a specific way. Let's talk about it related to pornography and pornography addiction. Mm -hmm. So how do, you, how do you speak about that as a sexual sin publicly and teach what the Bible says about it, but still create an environment where if you've got people in your church who are members or visitors trapped in pornography, they still feel like this is a place they can come and find ministry. Yeah, I think you let people know that there is something far better than they've ever imagined there, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that there's something far more fulfilling than images and imaginations, but there's a person, there's a relationship that God intends. So I think you speak clearly, but you speak with hope. That would be the short answer. And I think uh, Romans 3, God is both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You speak both of God's justice and you talk about God's provision uh, in the cross. And then you give people uh, the steps that they can take. So if you simply stand up and you're talking about pornography and you address, we have people in our congregation right now who are probably enslaved to the sin of pornography. You're, you're acknowledging that this is here. So this isn't just some other people who are outside. These are, these are people who are here. And then you say, uh, we want to help you with repentance in this. So here are, here are steps that you can take. We have these pastors who can meet with you. We have these uh, sorts of resources within our congregation. We want to fight together with you. Here's, here's what you do if you're in a marriage with someone who's in bondage to pornography. Those sorts of things where people know, I don't have to fight and struggle with this alone. And you do that publicly from the pulpit and then give people the opportunity to do that. I think, I think that's the way to go. And one very practical thing, I'm going to bring up elders again, you don't need to laugh, but one very practical thing we've done is when we've had, uh, in these cases it's been a brother, when we've had a brother in a very serious struggle with this, we've actually had him come before the elders uh, and talk to us, and we've asked him questions, and then we've prayed with him. Mm -hmm. And just we've done that. And uh, there are ripple effects. I mean, that gets out to the congregation. Mm -hmm. People talk about that. They talk about it in a, in a kind of fearful way and in a very loved way. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's there's very practical steps you can take in caring for one another and all kinds of sins. Mm -hmm. Last question for me, yeah. or if you have any more. I, I want to do one more after you're done. Okay. Last question for me. What have the two of you brothers learned over the last, say, 12 months in the race conversation that's been going on as regards to how we uh, raise, build up, lead our churches uh, in ways that are loving and understanding amidst the difficulties of this conversation, what's going on in America now. 
some things, some reflections that you've had over the last year? The first thing that I've learned is a disappointing thing. Um, I have learned just how much persistent, idolatrous, white supremacy there still is, uh, including among people who profess the name of Christ. It, it, it grieves me to see the sorts of things um, that I get in the mail or in my inbox. I will also say that for those who are ministering in places where that is taking place, often the way that happens now, there was a day when in certain places in this country, if you stood up and preached uh, the fact that, uh, that all are, are uh, equal in Christ, uh, you would have uh, members of the clan or deacons of the church or whatever coming to you and saying, you will stop preaching that, you will stop baptizing these people, you will do this. Now what tends to happen is that people who target that know that there's going to be a social disapproval of saying that sort of thing, so they divert the issue uh, and find another issue to attack that pastor on. And that happens uh, with much more regularity than I would assume. So that's a disappointing thing. On the, on the positive side, I see God uh, shaking loose uh, in the church, some, some of those carnal divisions uh, that we have, raising up a godly leadership uh, in America, in our context, that is not white and not majority culture. And that's where I think we're really going to see the, the change happening. Because I think right now, in our context, for a lot of, of white American Christians, when they read Galatians 3, God has, has brought Jew and Gentile together, they think, okay, white people are the Jews, and the Gentiles are the ethnic people. It's normal people and everybody else. There are no white people in uh, Ephesus. Uh, that, that, that's, that's not what's being talked about here. So when we're really going to see change is not when you have majority culture that's willing to coexist and minister to everybody else. What does God do? He brings in the Gentiles to minister to uh, the Jewish Christians in their need. And so when we start seeing white congregations who are calling African American and Hispanic and Asian American pastors, not because they're trying to reach a demographic group, but because they're saying this is our anointed leader that God has put in, that's when we're going to start to see some change here. And I, I see that on the horizon, I really do. Yeah, I don't know if in the last 12 months I've learned any new categories. Uh, this is a, a, a sadly and painfully old conversation. Uh, and, you know, as, as the oldest one up here, probably by a good bet, I mean, I can, the, my first year in public schools in rural Kentucky, in, uh, in my county, was the first year they were integrated. Uh, and so I even remember as a, as a six-year-old being at my grandmother's house for lunch after church on Sunday after the first week in school, and my, my grandmother and great aunt asking me if there were any little colored children. That's how they put it in my class. Well, being six years old, I had no idea. I didn't even think about that. So I, I literally didn't know how to answer. I didn't realize I was being maybe subtly, unintentionally, schooled in a kind of racism. And so I think I said something like, well, I'll, I'll check. <laughs> and so, uh, <laughs> you know, at school that week, you know, in my homeroom, the Grapevine Elementary School, I looked around, you know, and tried to think, well, what are they? Okay. You know, so, and I don't know the answer, like two, I, two people maybe. I came back and told them, and I didn't get much response. But I realize now, looking back, I was at the front end of a very new experience. So, as I say, it's a, it's a painfully old conversation, for, certainly for me. And I think this last 12 months, what it's done for me is just given me more specifics and things that I already know. So, I remember uh, Catherine, a member of our church, sharing with me um, about how she instructed, she's an African-American sister, how she instructed her two sons when they were around driving age, how they needed to act uh, with if they ever got pulled over. It's, it's all stories like that of personal incidents that don't give me new categories. Sadly, I already have those categories as a pastor for 21 years of a multiracial church somewhat. Uh, I have those categories in my mind, but I just keep getting more and more specifics added in, and everyone just, I feel, I feel heartbroken. And I feel like, sister, you have, you have lived 
in, in a way that I've never had to think twice uh, about that as a white guy. And I, I just need to be quiet and I need to listen. I need to understand more. And so it's just been another year of that, a, a long, painful, but as Russ is saying, I trust fruitful in God's, in God's providence, year of that. I would also say there's a, a, a cloud of witnesses, of heroes, whose names nobody knows in this denomination Amen. who stood up in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s and said the gospel is for all people the waters of baptism are for all people the lord's table is for all people who were fired who were sent out of their churches some of them who went without food some of them who took up uh, jobs as as janitors in order to feed their families and nobody knows who they are but their witness uh, the Lord knows that and honors that, and uh, I think about that uh, all the time these days. Well, I want to finish this off with one final question. Which is one more thing, oh, real quick sure. on this, just to pull this part of the conversation back around to where we started with the changes in the culture. So if you're here tonight and, and you're white and you do find this longing in your heart for 1950s Mayberry <laughs> or 1960s Mayberry, but you're just finding that's not there anymore, if you just look at your African-American brother or sister, they may have a lot of resources for you for following Jesus when the world's not very nice to you. So just realize their resources are our resources. Uh, ironically, in God's kindness, uh, the very ways that they have suffered uh, can be ways that he means for your good uh, and be tender and kind and learn a lot Realize that black history is not about a month in February. It's about our brothers and sisters in Christ often, and it's for all year round, and it's our history. And we need to understand that and know that and own that. Russ's point of the Gentiles instructing the Jews. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So closing, closing thoughts here. I'd love for you all to end with a word of encouragement to these pastors and leaders, moms and dads. We, we live in a tumultuous culture. It seems like things are shifting rapidly. It's hard to keep track of it all. It seems as if, if you were just looking at things externally, that things aren't going very well for the American church. What, what kind of word of encouragement or hope would you sound about the way that the gospel should shape our cultural engagement in the midst of these troubling times? Fear not, little flock, for it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Every part of that is important. Fear not. If we, if we fear and if we lack confidence in our gospel, we're going to turn mean uh, and resentful uh, toward uh, lost people and toward our, our mission field. Little flock, we, we recognize that it's not that we're suddenly a minority in the world. Jesus says we are always a minority presence in the world. No matter what the numbers of the church are, the wisdom of God is different than the wisdom of men. It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We can bear whatever it is, and we don't know what it is that we have to face in our individual lives or as a church. We can bear whatever it is because we have an inheritance that has been given to us that is not dependent upon all of those things, and it's God's good pleasure to grant those things to us and to take this time right now to prepare us to be able to exercise authority in that. So the main thing that I would say is let us be joyful, hopeful, convictional people who are not panicked, who are not distressed, and who are not tossed about like the wind. Yeah, and Russ, thank you for the way you've done that, brother. You, you have both commented realistically on the cultural challenges. You haven't blown smoke and been triumphalistic. But you have had such a note of confident joy in it that I think is so faithful to Scripture. So I'm just really thankful for that, brother. Thank you for that. I would just say Matthew uh, is so clear in Matthew's gospel in chapter 16. Jesus says, I'm building the church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates are the strongest part of the defense of the city because they, they can open up. That's where you have the thickest walls. They have the most manpower defending it. They will not prevail. So even the strongest parts will not prevail. You look at the Great Commission. That's not so much a challenge to us as it's God letting us know what his victory plan is. Mm -hmm. This is what he is doing. And you look at the book of Acts, that's exactly what he started doing. He, he did it, and he did it all the way to Rome. And from now, from the end of Acts till the Lord comes back, we're in the rest of it. And Revelation 22, they shall see God. That's where it ends up. They shall see God. When tragedy happens, start there very clearly. That is going to happen. And then just pull the camera back to get to right now. But realize it all ends up there, and that's a great place to end. 
Friends, thank you so much for being here tonight. Shall we thank Russ and Mark both? Tomorrow night, Nine Marks at Nine, and we got free book at Nine Marks booth uh, all day that, tomorrow. That was my first announcement uh, with, and tomorrow night it's with who? Uh, Al Moeller, Danny Aiken, David Platt, and H.B. Charles, Jr. And also, if you're interested in the Nine Marks at Southeastern Conference, you can get a $25 discount at the Southeastern uh, booth in the, the convention center. Do you have any ERLC announcements you want to make? Or? No, I think we covered it. Okay. Friends, let me, let me close this in prayer. Uh, Father God, we think of Paul's prayer for the Philippians when he prays that, that uh, their love would abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, that they might discern what is best and be pure and filled with the fruit of righteousness to the praise and glory of God. And Father, we pray that tonight's event, this conversation, these things that we've been talking about for, for all of us, the church leaders and the members here, that our love would abound more and more in knowledge of depths of, in, depth of insight, that we might discern what is best in all of these matters, questions of homosexuality and separation and race and abuse, discern what is best and so be pure and filled with the fruit of righteousness to the praise and glory of God.